Hey, welcome everyone to another episode of Keto Chat. I am your host, Carol Freeman, Certified Nutritionist, Keto Diet Specialist. And today I'm here, very excited to have Kelly of Kelly's Kitchen. Uh, let's see, let me read her bio so you know who she is too. So uh, Kelly Glogston is the founder and creator of thekellykitchen.com, an online food blog specializing in low carb cooking and a ketogenic lifestyle. Kelly develops and shares recipes and her expertise for low carb cooking and ketogenic lifestyle through her own journey to health. After years of her own gut issues, yo-yo dieting and ill health, Kelly went on to earn a certification in holistic health and nutrition. With trial error, lots of cooking and intense research, Kelly came upon the diet that changed her life forever. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Well, just to start out with, um, will you share, you know, what is your keto journey? Like, how did you hear about it? I, it, you know, I read in your bio here that, you know, you had some gut issues and stuff like that, but just tell us a little more about what the journey has been for you. Sure. So, um, I grew up in the seventies where, you know, the dietary guidelines came out in 1977 and, you know, being from a family that was into health and into nutrition um, you know, we decided that as a family that we were going to, you know, get on board and be as healthy as we possibly could. I was a division one intercollegiate athlete for the volleyball player for the University of San Diego. I was a junior national paddle tennis champion. So our family was very active and very into health. But when those dietary guidelines came out, um, every ounce of fat and every ounce of flavor left the house. And so for decades, we were on this journey of a whole grain, low fat, mostly vegetarian sort of diet. But throughout those years, my weight fluctuated a lot. And I never really could get uh, into a mode or a system of anything that felt like it was a lifestyle for me. It was just always a struggle. And I, I ranged in weight, um, you know, it was a pretty big spectrum. The lowest end was about 125 and the highest end was about 204. Now I know that's a pretty big uh, spectrum there, but I, I, I typically sat in the middle there. Um, I currently am 135 pounds and I'm 5'9". And I, once I found keto, I have effortlessly been this way for three years. So for me, it has become a lifestyle. But how I got there is that in my uh, early 30s, I had two small children, a husband, I was living in the Northeast, I was a stay-at-home mom, and I got really sick. I um, developed diverticulitis, and if those of you who don't know what that is, it's an infection in your, um, your lower, lower sigmoid colon. And um, it's not a typical thing for people that are in their early 30s. Um, but it was incredibly painful. Um, luckily, I was able to treat it with antibiotics and figured that I would just sort of like be on my way and be, you know, healthy again. Um, I went on for the next decade to have diverticulitis seven more times. So wow. Wow. one, yeah, just wreaked havoc on my gut flora. Um, you know, my, my stomach was distended or not for about a decade. And the, the dis disconcerting thing is that nobody could really tell me what to eat. Um, while I was going through this, I thought to myself, well, I need to go to school because I'm going to figure this thing out and I'm going to take the classes and go to, go to um, the Institute of Integrative Nutrition to learn how to take care of myself because clearly I wasn't connecting with what was being taught to me for my doctor's offices. After I graduated from IIN, I got sick for the seventh time and I said, this has got to end. Um, I was still doing what I was thought I was supposed to be doing, calories in, calories out, eating all my whole grains, calorie restriction, beating the crap out of myself in the gym, running half marathons and triathlons and spinning and all that sort of stuff. So I went on uh, about three years ago to have about a foot of my colon removed. It was a pretty expensive and extensive and painful surgery, but it didn't end there. 
because after I got out of the hospital, I got an infection. I got another infection. I got C. diff, which I'm not going to go into that, but it's a really awful uh, infection. And I was on eight rounds of antibiotics in about 12 weeks. And again, nobody could tell me what to eat other than continue eating your rainbow jello and uh, mashed potatoes with some sort of a mystery gravy on them and everything I was served in the hospitals four times in 12 weeks. Um, it, they would serve it to me. And I'd be like, this is healthy. Um, and late 2016, I came across a book by Dr. Jason Fung hmm. and the obesity code, it made a lot of sense to me. But the interesting part that I found was that nobody could really tell me what to eat. And then I read this book that's telling me not to eat anything. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't read the book, and I highly recommend it, it's called The Obesity Code by Dr. Jason Fung. It talks a lot about fasting and autophagy and healing yourself from the inside and giving your body the opportunity to um, self-correct and heal itself. If you're not spending a whole lot of time digesting food, your body's got to feed on something. So I started with intermittent fasting and I didn't even really dive into my, uh, my diet. I was still eating my whole grains, but I was still having chronic urinary tract infections and chronic yeast infections. And I was like, Hmm, okay. From everything that I know, I know that sugar feeds all of that stuff. So let's, let's start looking at like taking the sugar out of my diet. Um, and Dr. Jason Fung's books and other books that I sort of dove into at that point, they talked a lot about the ketogenic diet and the low carb diet. And this within a month of going on those diets, I knew I was on the track to pure health. So even though when I started this, I wasn't overweight, I was actually underweight. Um, even though I started it, all of a sudden now I'm healthy, but now for three years, I have maintained the, the weight which for decades plagued me, decades of roller coaster up and down. So that is kind of how I got started on the ketogenic and intermittent fasting journey. And it's been, um, it's been a lifesaver and, and a game changer for me. So I love it. Oh, that's so amazing. And it's, it's um, I mean, I love hearing everybody's story because there's so many people that have had to go, you know, deep into sickness in order to find this way of living and healing. And, um, and, and everybody's got a different journey. And it's sad that we have to get that sick before we're so desperate to be able to figure this out. But the good news is because of social media and things like this, this video that we're doing right here, allow us to share with so many more people to get the word out that you don't have to wait until you're that sick to get the, you know, to follow this way of eating. So I'm sorry what you've been through and thank you so much for sharing your story in order to help other people. Um, and, um, so I'm, I'm curious. So, so from there, you know, lead us into how did Kelly's kitchen come about? So the Kelly kitchen started, um, almost right after I started ketogenic, a ketogenic lifestyle. And when I knew that I couldn't easily, you know, go grab a takeout or go grab, you know, and that I was going to have to start cooking for myself, I decided that I was going to try and recreate a lot of um, things that I eat in my daily, in, uh, that I used to eat in my daily life. Well, how can I do that now? So one of the messages that I try to impart um, and, and it goes hand in hand with how the Kelly Kitchen started is that when I started, I had little kids, I had babies. Um, I lived in a crappy little tiny apartment in Santa Monica with my angry husband and a box of meat helper. And I, I mean, <laughs> oh, <laughs> meat helper, that's so funny way of like disguising the real name of it. <laughs> yes. So the meat helper, um, it was my way to get dinner on the table fast. And that was 20 years ago that there was just a lot of trial and error of how am I going to feed my family fast and how am I going to, um, you know, get some nutrition in them um, and do it on a budget as well. And so over 20 years, it's been a lot of trial and error in the kitchen, a lot of garbage can worthy meals 
that my children and my ex-husband will attest to. Um, but it was, it, it became a love of cooking, but also taking care of myself. And so three years ago when I started cooking, um, I was creating meals at home and I would sort of start thinking about, okay, well, if I'm going to take what most restaurants use as a base, whether it's a potato skin or a bowl of pasta or, um, it, you know, like a French roll or bread or whatever it may be, when you take all those things out and you're left with your protein and your fat and your vegetable, how can we enhance those things? And so it, it grew from there. And, um, you know, I started posting pictures about it. I started sharing with friends. And I, my boyfriend at the time was like, what are we doing in the Kelly kitchen today? And so that's how the Kelly kitchen got started. I um, taught myself how to do the website. I built the entire website by myself. I taught myself how to take all the pictures. Um, I, you know, I just, I have such a passion and drive to be able to share with people that this to, it is just real food. It, there's nothing fancy about it. There's nothing, you know, keto, I think a lot of people hear that. I mean, it's just been my experience. Maybe you can tell me differently. It's been my experience that when people hear keto, they think, oh my God, this is super scientific. I'm going to have to really devote a, a ton of time and calculation to figuring all this out. And basically to me, it's just real food. And we're taking out actually the fake food. We're taking out the box food. We're taking out the processed food. Um, but we've grown, we've been in a society where um, they have made it so easy for us. They have made it so easy um, that you don't even really have to think about it. You just go into the freezer and pull out your dinner. Um, so that's how the Kelly Kitchen got started with my learning how to make all these foods and, and create these foods, but also trying to share with other people that this is just real food and we don't have to, um, you know, rely on packaged big companies to provide our food for us. And I, I also, you know, I have two daughters, they're both teen, well, one's a teenager and one's 20. And they've always seen me cooking, but I think one of the greatest gifts that we can give to our children, instead of saying, I hate cooking, it's, this is how I can take care of myself. And it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, so that, that's how it started and it, it fuels my flames. And um, you know, I have uh, so much food in, in my kitchen, in my freezer, in my fridge, that if anybody is driving by and wants to stop by for lunch or dinner, please call me. Okay. Because uh, I'm always looking for, for, for people to, to feed. Oh, nice. So would you say you love to cook or it's just uh, grown out of necessity and you enjoy sharing the keto message and cooking with people? That's a great question. Um, and I know I'm probably a little bit in the minority, but I really love cooking. But let me tell you also why, because it is b because I can take care of myself. But one of the greatest parts of me cooking is that it's, it's a family affair. Mm. Now, no one else in my family cooks, but, if I, but they all eat whatever I make. If I had to do everything, then it would be my journey and they would just be sort of hopping on. Um, at the beginning of the week, I ask everybody what their schedules are and what they feel like eating for this week. Um, I happen to love grocery shopping. I know that's kind of a little strange too, but I love grocery shopping. It's a creative outlet for me to sort of think about what I can create. Um, if nobody's going to be home that week, I don't have to do any cooking or planning or, or whatever, but if they are going to be home, I go and do all the grocery shopping, but guess what? They empty the car. They put it all away. I cook it all. Um, I have another, my boyfriend does all of the dishes. Um, my daughter empties the dishwasher. I never empty the dishwasher. That's the job I hate to do. But I think the, pa the part that it is a family affair and we're all in this together. If it were, if I were just doing it for myself, 
that would be fine too, because I would, I could cook whatever I wanted to, and I could, you know, eat leftovers when I wanted to, or I could skip a meal if I wanted to. But when you have everybody involved, um, and everybody says, yeah, I feel like eating tacos tonight. You know, it's, it's deflating to, as when I was a young mom, to bring a meal to the table and you have two kids that are like, eh, I don't want to eat that. And then somebody else in the house is saying, yeah, let's just go out for pizza. And I'm like, oh my God, what if I, and then I've got to clean it all up. I've got to, you know, whatever. So the family affair or having to some input in that has been really helpful and drive a driver for me. Mm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And I, I love that, you know, we, we teach our kids and our family how to eat based on what we're eating. And so many people, uh, you know, think that like, well, keto is a good for me, but you know, I gotta let my kids have all those kid foods. Right. Um, but I, I, my opinion is, is that it's more important for kids to eat really healthy food because they're building the foundation of their health for the rest of their lives. Like if you were building a house, would you just like take cut corners on the foundation to be like, ah, we'll just fix it later when we build the rest of the house. But right, right. right. And what's the saying? If you teach it, if you give them a fish, they'll eat for a day. If you teach them the fish, they will eat for life. And so um, my girls actually do, they do pretty well. They, they're not fully keto, but um, they, they really try. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a progression for them as well when I'm not around to cook for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's empowering for the kids to see you doing that, but also just making that choice themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, when they, when they notice how much better they feel, I find that kids are like, it tastes good and I feel better when I eat this way. So they can make that choice for themselves instead of being forced to eat anything. So, right. So I forgot to ask too. So uh, once you started adopting uh, a keto, low carb way of living, uh, what happened to your health? Um, so uh, pretty much immediately. Um, so again, I, I mentioned that I was a little bit underweight um, and I wasn't necessarily sleeping the best. Um, so besides that I actually gained a little bit of weight, which I needed to, um, which I, I, that always sounds kind of weird to me because I was such a yo-yo dieter, but I gained a little bit of weight and it was sort of like a good thing for me. I filled out and I felt strong, but, um, the other part of keto is that, um, and intermittent fasting is that I just had this level of freedom and clarity in my mind, in my work focus. Um, I, I just sort of, I always have a skip in my step. Um, my, my boyfriend and I have this thing about, you know, we really guard um, our sleep very, very, very closely. And, um, you know, he's away right now. And I, I've said to him, oh, I didn't sleep very well last night. And he was like, when did you turn off the, your devices or whatever? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I got out of my rhythm. But when I'm in my rhythm, um, I mean, I can get a solid seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And that just drives my whole day the next day. Um, I, you know, I think that there's so many kids and people that, you know, part of their, the, the, I mean, I think maybe the first level is if they could just get a full night's sleep, what could they, what could happen with this world? Like, what can we create with this world if people just actually slept? Um, so my sleep improved. Um, I actually started taking, um, some collagen, um, so that I could um, help with my the thickness of my hair and my skin, and um, that has really changed. I just add a little scoop of that. Nothing. It's nothing special. Just some collagen hydrolysate into my morning coffee, and um, yeah, it's just you know I, I'm like a little energizer buddy <laughs> that I just constantly going. Well, and you mentioned too, so you came from a place of, you know, chronic UTIs and yeast infections and the diverticulitis and the chronic infections. Um, you know, what's, what's happened that ways for you? Oh, they're all gone. Okay. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I know to you it was like obvious, but uh, we didn't I know. talk about it. Interestingly so. enough, um, my last cold, like sore throat, cough, 
that lasted for probably four days was in November of 2017. I mean, think about that. I used to get cold, like a huge cold, sinus infections. Um, I haven't been on antibiotics since I, you know, since 2016. Um, and, you know, that was sort of a regular thing. It was like, yeah, just give her a prescription for, you know, amoxicillin or Keflex or whatever. Um, so I haven't had to be on any medication at all. Um, and I haven't had a urinary tract infection or a yeast infection. I will say that something that sort of happens because I'm baking all the time, um, I don't eat everything that I bake, but I am sort of eating a lot more carbs and you sort of get that carb creep when you're tasting all of these things that are keto friendly, but they, they still have carbs. I do tend to feel like, oh, I feel like I might have a little something going on here. I better knock that off. Mm. And I do. I cut it out and kind of reset my back to baseline of how I eat and bring down my carb, or I should say not bring it down, but just get a little tighter on my carb count. Um, because I, you know, I'm in general a pretty loose, I'm pretty liberal with my carb counting. Um, I sort of keep it in my head. And when I, when I feel myself sort of slipping or getting off track, I will tighten that thing up and, and get back to normal. So I haven't had, I haven't had any urinary tract infections, um, bladder infections, kidney infections. Um, and then I know that there's a whole community of people that have C. diff. And I won't go into C. diff too much because it's really, it's, it's sort of a devastating sickness and there's not a whole lot. I mean, there's, it's, there's, well, let's just leave it at that. But the, the number one fear that I had after having C. diff is that you really can't go on antibiotics anymore because if you do, you'll have a recurring mm. um, C. diff bout. And it's, it's incredibly painful, really tough to get rid of. Um, and so, in these three years, being on keto, I haven't had to go on any, any antibiotics for anything, for sinus infection or bladder infection or any of those sorts of things. So it sort of is, you know, kept me away from having to take antibiotics, which could, you know, make me get C. diff again. So it sort of, you know, kind of goes all circle. So if I don't have to do, if I don't eat this, then I don't have to go on antibiotics. If I don't go on antibiotics, then I don't get C. diff and it's sort of this circle. And so it's been, a, it's been three years of, of I would say, um, the best health that I've ever been in my life. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's not a surprise to me that uh, all the immune stuff gets better. I just had to actually get you to, to share it because uh, there's a lot of other people out there struggling with that too. And it's mm -hmm. similar for me, like I don't get colds and the flu anymore. And I was somebody that, you know, several times a year would get just, you know, a flu that would knock me out 10 days or whatever. It's just, it's like, no, everyone else around me is getting sick and they all say this and that and the other. And it's like, it just doesn't even, doesn't even hit. So. <laughs> well, and the immediacy of running to the doctor to get a prescription for an antibiotic um, needs to, that needs to be changed um, because there's a lot of things that we get that if we just take care of ourselves and eat better, that we will heal ourselves and we don't need to immediately pop a pill because, you know, it might, that might not even fix the problem. It might even strip your gut even more. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so how do you, how do you measure success now in your, your health and even in your kitchen? Yes. Well, um, you know, I, I would be lying if I said I didn't weigh myself or that I didn't check the, the fitness of my, the fit of my clothing. Um, I really check in with myself about um, my energy levels, how much I'm sleeping. Um, I do loosely track my scale weight. Um, I loosely track how my clothes are feeling. Um, and so on a fitness level and a sort of, I guess, a vanity level, those are some of the things that I do health-wise. I just, I check in with how am I feeling? If my energy is low or I'm feeling down or I'm not sleeping well, then I have to, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in tune with 
I know how great it feels to feel really good. And when I don't feel that way, I'm going to do everything I can to get back there. So that's one thing. Measuring success in the kitchen, well, there's a couple things. <laughs> if I have a, so my boyfriend is very sweet and anything I feed him, he's like, that's amazing. <laughs> one time I made, um, I just sauteed some zucchini with a little bit of feta and some butter and some garlic. And I, and I went to sprinkle some pepper on and the lid fell off <laughs> the pepper. And so <laughs> it was a very peppery zucchini dish. He ate the whole thing anyway. I tried to scoop as much pe pepper out as I possibly could, but he ate the whole thing anyways. And he was like, that was great. It was a little spicy, but um, I love making things that people that are not keto, they eat it. I don't tell them. And I'm like, and they're like, this is amazing. This is delicious. Whether it's a dessert or even, you know, when I, um, when I smoke a rack of barbecued ribs and then I have a, a low sugar barbecue sauce and I have a big party over or I make a big platter of tacos or whatever it may be, people don't even know. And that to me is like, woohoo! I made something that they, you know, that doesn't taste like diet food mm -hmm. um, because it is just real food. And then once they sort of taste that, they think, huh, this isn't so hard. This isn't so weird. This isn't so sciencey. And so that's a huge win for me. And that's also how I, how I measure success. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I have a lot of friends that want to start keto and um, you know, I help, I hold their hand a little bit and I, you know, I share with them everything that I possibly can. Um, and so when I have friends that have started the keto journey and they lose weight or they're feeling better, um, that's also a little bit of a win for me. I do think that some of my friends are afraid to tell me that they have gone keto, even though I know that they have, <laughs> I think that they're a little bit afraid because I am so passionate about the food that, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning, I'm texting them like, what do you think of, you know, if I were to make buffalo chicken in, um, you know, zucchini boats, does that sound like something, you know, and I'll send them pictures of popsicles or pictures of, of a cheesecake or pictures of a casserole. And they're like, enough with the food. <laughs> <laughs> I think that some people hold off and don't tell me that they're doing keto, but um, that's also another win if I can share with friends um how to live this way and that it's not so so difficult oh that's cool yeah and that's uh it's fun to see those ripples and waves of uh impact we have on other people in the world so absolutely what are some of the common mistakes that you see or missteps that people you know do when they're first starting out so um i mentioned this a little bit for the the carb creep Mm -hmm. is that's a real thing. And what I mean when I say the carb creep is that there, there are carbs and things that you wouldn't necessarily know that there are carbs in. Um, and just because it's a keto friendly food doesn't mean that it doesn't have any carbs in it. You know, broccoli has carbs in it and cauliflower has carbs in it and nuts have carbs in it. I, I had no idea in the beginning, like I just thought, oh, Nuts are carb friendly or nuts are keto friendly. So my favorite nut is cashews. <laughs> and so I'd have a serving of cashews and I'd be like, oh my gosh, there's 10 carbs in one serving. Um, so that was a little bit of a wake up call. And I think that um, there's a lot of what happens or the mistake that happens is that they'll go to a restaurant and they'll order something and then they won't realize that you know, it was dipped in flour or that maybe they added flour to the soup or that, um, you know, they added some sugar, you know, like they think, oh, I got the salad with the chicken and with the avocado and with the slivered almonds and with the greens. And it was a great keto thing. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And I say to them, what was the dressing that you used? Hmm. And they're like, oh, I used a poppy seed vinaigrette. I'm like, you know, was it sweet? And they're like, <laughs> yeah. <but laughs> so I think those hidden carbs, um, you know, we really need to be diligent about what, it, especially when other people are serving us, um, because those carbs add up. And so those are the two things that I see the most is the carb creep, thinking that everything is uh, 
a free food or because it's keto friendly, we can eat whatever we want of it. And then the other is the hidden, the hidden carbs and the hidden sugars. Yeah. A lot of people are surprised to find out that, you know, vegetables are not all you can eat uh, on a keto diet because every other diet that we follow is, you know, the vegetables are one thing you can eat. So you try to fill up on those. So right, right. my clients start out and they find out that they actually have to limit their servings of vegetables that makes their head spin a little bit sometimes right right well and for me i try to sort of say to anybody that i'm talking to is that look i i would rather that you eat you know if you're gonna overeat anything i'd rather that you overeat broccoli than ding dongs or doritos or <laughs> you know whatever it may be you know croissants or donuts i'd rather that you overeat broccoli but let's keep it all in check because broccoli still does have carbs yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Broccoli's, broccoli's win over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, um, so let's talk about kitchen tips. So what, uh, what tips do you have for people in their kitchen? Making so I like to batch cook. Okay. Um, again, I, I, I sort of assess what everyone in my house is doing. If it's just me, I know how I can sort of in general know what I'm gonna do for the week. I, I, um, one of my favorite things to do is to shop my fridge. I shop my freezer and I shop my fridge and I think to myself, okay, what needs to be eaten this week? Mm. What do I have on hand? You know, if I have some New York strip steaks in my freezer and I think to myself, hmm, I think I wanna have like, steak tacos this week. Okay, great. I've got this, the, the frozen, I use butcher box. I don't know if you have, have, um, any of that, but butcher box has been sort of my savior. Um, I always have ground beef in there. So I, I, I shop my fridge and my freezer. I, um, I never thought about that before, but I love that term. And I never, I, I usually do that as well. And I never even thought of it being a thing. Yeah. So I love that. Shop your fridge to see what you've got in there already as a base for meals. I love that. Absolutely. So I think one of my greatest recipes came from um, shopping my fridge. I, um, I said to my family, like, what do you feel like eating this week? And obviously pizza is pretty much on <laughs> the menu. People love it. Um, but I opened up the fridge and I was like, wow, I've got portobello pizzas in here. Um, somebody else threw out in the family that they wanted to have something with pesto. And I was like, oh, this could be interesting. Let's make portobello pesto pizzas in the oven. And it has become one of our staples. And um, so I, I kind of ask people what they want to eat. And then I shop my fridge. And then I go to the supermarket and I batch cook. Um, so that, that's sort of one of my number one tips. Another thing that I do that I, if you are a mayonnaise eater, I know that there are some non-mayonnaise eaters. My, my son is a mayonnaise freak. I don't know where he got, actually, I know where he got it. He got it from my mom, but like okay. the kid will literally eat out of the mayonnaise jar, like spoonfuls in his mouth. <laughs> and, I, and I love mayonnaise too, not that much. Okay. I love mayonnaise too, but so, um, and I've also become a huge fan of the Instant Pot. Um, I, as much cooking as I've done, I was a little afraid of it, but I just kept practicing at it and doing some really basic things. When I started the keto journey, I made um, chicken salad, like a scoop of chicken salad. That has always been one of my go-to things. So first, I would just buy the chicken salad already made. And then I was like, hmm, I was at Costco and I bought a rotisserie chicken there. They're huge, they're five bucks. They're filled with a bunch of stuff that you probably should not be eating. Um, I don't know if they tell you the carb count of any of the fillers on the Costco, but at the time it fit my budget and it worked well. And I would bring that Costco chicken home and I would make chicken salad that I would put celery and a little bit of scallion and mayonnaise, cracked pepper. Um, and I would keep that in my fridge. And I do the same thing with, tim um, with tuna salad and with egg salad. But the thing about my instant pot is that every Sunday or Monday, I go to the store and I get a pallet of um, hormone-free, organic, um, rib-in, skin-on chicken breasts. And they typically are less expensive when they've got the ribs on and the skin on. 
And I need those things for the flavor. And in my Instant Pot, I can make about five pounds of chicken, rotisserie chicken a week. And it only takes about an hour and a half. And I don't even really have to do anything with it. And I take that chicken and I make my chicken salad. And I also use it for other things that I'm going to have during the week. And if I don't use it for other things that I'm going to have in the week, I freeze it so that I can. I can add it to soups. Um, if I keep some fresh, not chicken salad with the mayonnaise, I'll add it to other salads. Um, I make, um, one of my greatest recipes is um, chicken enchiladas, which um, I made this week. And I use um, my keto tortillas. Um, they are labor intensive, but they only have one gram net carb and they're made with coconut flour and egg whites. And they, they're not eggy, I promise. Um, but I use that chicken to make my chicken enchiladas. Um, I have a very small kitchen, and I'm pointing that way because it's right there. Um, I have a very small kitchen, but you don't need a big kitchen. If you know where everything is in your kitchen, um, you know how you can grab these things. And when my children are emptying the dishwasher, they know to put it back in that area. So it speeds up the process that I always know where this slicer is, or I always know where this knife is, or I always know where these spices are, and it just speeds up the process. So I have a, more tips too, I can keep going, but I, that's, you know, those are my, those are my staples that I use. Oh, excellent, excellent too. Um, all right, what else? Let's talk about, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there blogging about keto, um, you know, who do you look for for inspiration and, you know, how, how have you weeded, weeded out the, what, what is that phrase about the, the wheat from the chaff? Is that, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's not a keto reference. How do, no, how do you know? No, but I, I completely understand you. Um, there is so much out there and, and I don't want to say that it's all bad, but there are different levels um, and, you know, the keto police come out in full force and you know they will say you can't eat carrots or you can't you know whatever it may be and um i am a believer that um we it's it's an individual journey and the um the people that i listen to are the ones that um can really cite the science and they're not just sort of uh talking in generalities um, I, I never want to be seen as the scientific um, uh, medical expert advice, um, but I defer to um, the medical professionals that are up on all the studies. And I tell you, when I hear anybody that, that starts talking about, you know, how many calories is in that or... Um, you know, talking about anything that seems so old school, I just glaze over and I think to myself, I, I can't even. Um, a gal that I grew, I didn't grow up with her, but I've known her a very long time. She is a registered dietitian. She went to Institute of Integrative Nutrition with me. Um, she is a health coach and a nutritionist. Um, and she's posting all over every social thing I can see about how horrible intermittent fasting is. And I just, I kind of cringe because I think to myself, have you not seen any of the, any of the things, any of the true studies that have come out? Like, what, ugh. so I try not to get too much into the, the technicality of it because I think that that should be left to people who can speak more eloquently than I can. Um, I like to fashion myself as I, if, if you have bought into this lifestyle, I want to help you create the foods that are going to help you stay in this life. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how I differentiate myself is that I'm not, you know, I think that diet is kind of like religion and politics. Like there's no way I am going to, if you are so far over there that I'm going to bring you in over here, but if you are interested and if you want to explore this because you agree with this lifestyle, then let me show you how to stay in this lifestyle and how to make it an easy sort of effortless 
um, habits throughout your life? Oh, you're so wise. I, I am in the same uh, boat. It's like if people want to know about keto, I'm here to talk about it, but I'm not out there trying to convince anyone anything different than what they, they already believe. And, uh, and, and then also, I know the people that are naysayers about it are the ones that I haven't tried it themselves, and they mm -hmm. also haven't worked with it in their own clients. So Right. Uh, right. Well, and how about this one? So I was, I, somebody said to me, oh, I've tried keto. It doesn't work for me. Yeah. So my favorite question is, um, number one, how, what did you follow? Like, who were you following and who was giving you the advice? And number two question, how long did you do it for? Because this isn't a three week quick fix. This is a lifetime and it is, it is for the long haul. So I asked this to somebody the other day that said, you know, Keto doesn't work for me. It causes huge problems. It doesn't work. And I was like, well, how long did you do it for? And she was like, three solid weeks. And I was like, oh, and, and who, who did you get your information from? She was like, oh, this gal that's like a yoga instructor down in the South. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, how is that even real? And so, it, you know, for me, it gives it a bad name because it gives keto and low carb living sort of a bad name because no, you know, when they're not really dedicated to it or where they're not really taking it very seriously and they're immediately discounting it, um, it's mm -hmm. disappointing. So I just try to lead by example. And, you know, the longer I keep doing this, I see my stuff going like this and theirs are still going like this. Well, that's so true. I mean, I see um, two groups of people that the keto doesn't work for. And one, the one group is what you're describing is that um, they just weren't doing it right. And part of that is that I, I found working with you know over 400 people doing this is that that it needs to be customized for each person. There's no one size fits all approach. So most people just don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not doing it correctly. They're not actually doing it completely. They're doing it that, a lot of times you you prob, probe them probe prod them a little bit probe probe them a little bit and then they say well I was doing keto ish you yeah know? ish right yeah. the other I can still drink my wine yeah. and. <laughs> The other group, though, that I find that um, that have a lot of problems with keto, and I think this gets mixed up in where um, some people out there, their so-called um, experts that aren't really, are saying that keto needs to be different for women. Um, mm -hmm. The group of women that I find that that have problems with keto are the ones that are already very low body fat, right? So there mm -hmm. are the eternal um, health nuts. Maybe they're doing CrossFit. Their body fat is already, you know, somewhere below 22%. And they're trying to get that, you know, six pack ab look. And really a woman's body hormonally works best if it's between about 22 to 29% body fat. So we've got these fitness models that are showing this body type that really isn't natural for most women's bodies. Mm -hmm. And so when they are trying to get their body fat down to 18% or lower and they do keto, it's the calorie restriction at that lower body fat that causes problems it's not keto itself and so right. then keto gets blamed for the hormonal problems and thyroid issues and all this other stuff that comes up um, that's the other group i'll throw that out there too that that's the other group that i find of women that have problem with uh, with doing keto but it's not keto that's doing it it's trying to create something in their body that isn't naturally a, a healthy state to be in so right um let's see um so, oh, what, so where, where are you going next? What's your future plans with uh, Keto and Kelly Kitchen? So the Kelly Kitchen is, um, it is growing and um, it's, it's, it's catching steam. Um, I, I think people are a little um, amused by my antics. Um, I've just started a YouTube live channel on Monday nights. I, um, I share kitchen tips and for an hour I'm in there cooking and people are asking questions. I drop stuff all the time. It's pretty funny and I'm pretty silly. So my YouTube channel is growing so that I can show people real time tips and tricks about how to get dinner on the table. Um, the website, thekellykitchen.com, I'm constantly posting new recipes. Um, I am writing a cookbook. Um, it'll be out probably within the next six months. Um, it is a labor of love and a lot of work going into that. Um, but it, it, there's a whole line of cookbooks that are going to be coming after that. 
and um, I'm just going to continue having fun with and, and showing people that the keto lifestyle is, um, it's just real food. And I, I'm hoping that people can get on board with um, less processed and more taking care of themselves. Oh, that's lovely. That's great. That's so, you're doing good work, Kelly. Thanks Thank for being you. out there in the world. Yes. Uh, so anything else uh, in wrapping this up, anything else that you were, um, you know, hoping I would ask about or you'd like to share? Well, I don't, you know, I, I'm so incredibly um, grateful that we were able to do this and, you know, being able to, to talk to um, an individual keto coach, um, but also for me to be in the space as well, um, you know, the whole idea is that, you know, anything that I may have said that could help the people that you help and anything that you say, I'm hoping that it can help the people that, that I help. Um, because I think that this is a movement um, of, of us trying to lessen medication and teach our families how to eat well and be healthy. Um, so I don't, I don't think I have any other questions, but I, I'm so grateful that we had this time together. And um, I have, you know, just so much um, passion for this life. And, and I, I wish that nobody has to go through the pain that I, and it wasn't just the physical pain, but the decade long of roller coastering, because that is very painful to go yeah. up and down and to not know how to do it and to be feeling like a failure. Um, so I hope to continue on sh sharing that message that, um, you know, you don't have to get deathly ill to start to feel better. Oh, that's lovely. I have one, one closing question for you. Um, and uh, everyone who was watching, uh, all of Kelly's links are going to be in the, the show notes below. So, um, and we'll put a link in there to, you can follow so that when her book gets released, you can grab that too. So, but the, my final question for you is um, the meteors coming at us today, the last day on earth, we're all going to be wiped out. Uh, what's going to be your final meal? Oh my gosh, that is a great question. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, because I'm vacillating here. I love buffalo chicken stuff, but I made this crispy salmon with creamy, it's stuffed with the creamy spinach over a bed of zoodles. Oh my God, it was so delicious. So, and I, but quite frankly, I didn't think that I was gonna be like a salmon person, but that one I really think is, um, and the web, that, that recipe is not up on the website yet, but I'm going to scramble and get that up on the website this weekend. Um, but yes, my creamy spinach um, stuffed salmon is probably the last meal that I would have. Any desserts, beverages to go oh with? Oh my it? gosh, desserts. Don't get me started. Yeah. Um, so I just made, and this recipe is up on the website, um, a mini Oreo cheesecake bites and they're in little muffin cups and they're actually fairly easy to make. Um, and then I also made a mini lava cake, which is fantastic. I mean, I've got so many desserts. My number one dessert right now is um, it's a no bake, um, low carb. It's um, only three grams net carb um, strawberry cheesecake cup. And mm -hmm. That one is got a lot of attention because anybody can make it and you don't have to turn the oven on. And that one's on the website also. Sweet. I'm going to go look now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kelly, thank you so much for being here and sharing um, all of your, your journey to health and all your tips for success on keto and in the kitchen. Um, if you guys enjoyed this, give us a thumbs up subscribe hit the bell down there as well that's how you're going to get notifications of uh future episodes so thanks again for being here kelly thank you thank you so much and be well all right